welcome to the video. This one is totally different to what we've been doing and finds the weight. I'll explain why in a yes, moment. Yes, we love the Lord. And what do we hate? Sin! Yes, we hate sin. First of all, I can't actually see an awful lot because I had an eye operation when I went to India a couple of weeks ago. So I'll tell you more about that right at the end. If you want to hear all that stuff, wait till the end of this short video. In the meantime, I'm going to tell you something which one of the biggest, closest kept secrets of the pub rock era. The pub rock was not just not just one era, and I'll tell you why after this. Right, we all know that there always was music in pubs in London through the 60s and the early 70s, but in 1971, it's generally accepted that uh, a whole new era started. It's partly to do with a firm called Fame Shares, and if you want to know more about that, then read Will Birch's book, No Sleep Till Canby Town, and this book here by Simon Matthews tells you and more. Both books are very detailed. All these are videos I make are just about my life in the pub rock era. I was involved in quite a few things, so it's quite broad, but it's not meant to be a comprehensive guide. So if you think you're after a comprehensive guide, then go elsewhere. But I'm going to tell you the truth about the two eras of pub rock. The first one was from, let's say, when it started in 1971, when Dave Robinson and all that lot of people he was involved with started getting Irish pubs mainly to put on live music and it so blossomed and led to an explosion that I don't think they were expecting. By the way, if you think differently to what I'm saying, please comment down below. And if you like this video, please like it. And of course, if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. By the mid 1970s, by 74, 75, pub rock was huge. I mean, there were dozens of pubs, putting on music in at London. Some were free all the time, some were free during the week and then charged the weekends, and others charged every night. So it was like a whole new thing. This is not the video about that, this is the video about there being two strands. If you look at Will Birch's book, No Sleep Till Candy Island, then you'll know that that sort of ends about 1979, 1980, when um, Stiff Records has blossomed and everything's happy and Ian Jury and the Blockheads and uh, Elvis Costello and the Attractions and all these other bands are like in the charts and stuff and everybody's making loads of money. Well, not everybody, but you know what, what I mean. Um, that really was the end of that era because like that was what Dave Robinson and his crew wanted. They, I think that they had a long-term aim which was like to make stars basically and um, they had succeeded and they got themselves the businesses and Dave Robinson and Andrew Jakeman who became Jake Riviera who went off to do other things they had their life they've been part of that pub rock boom and it had by that stage it had produced punk and there was all sorts of different strands of music nurtured in the London pubs and about 1980 that was the end of the first golden age of pub rock which lasted from 71 to 1980 the second wave included Places like my venue, the Cricketers at Kennington Oval, the Bull and Gate at Kentish Town, the Dublin Castle, Bridge House at Kennington Town. Yes, OK, so I've mentioned that, because that's the one that people say, why don't you mention the Bridge House? But there were lots of venues. I mean, literally dozens of venues. And the second wave, I think, was more important than the first wave. <gasps> Controversial. The second wave, it became indie music. It was much wider. At the Cricketers, for example, we'd have, like, things. We had the first London show from the Happy Mondays. <laughs> We had Essie Roger, who was like from Sierra Leone. Singing my riddle cowboy song. Oh, yippee, yeah, yippee, yeah, yeah. And we had um, Ted Hawkins, who we're not supposed to talk about now. You're mistaken. My heart's aching. I ain't picking. Laurel Aitken and Desmond Decker and Gino Washington and Steve Marriott. What you gonna do? And I could go on for hours and hours and hours listening to them. And then all the indie bands came out. I used to book things from a guy called Mike Hink, who's recently died, sadly, who we used to work at, I think it was All Trade Booking. That was the agency arm of Rough Trade. I mean, I can't remember all, all the acts now. There's, there are loads of Will Party, Food Records, all their bands. It was the golden age to me of pub rock. And that all ended in 1990. The 30th of September, 1990 was when the second wave of pub rock ended. Not because that's when we left the cricketers, though coincidentally that was part of it, it's because Margaret Thatcher brought in the beer orders which changed the way pubs 
operated. It basically said that breweries who owned most of the pubs back then couldn't own more than a certain number. I think it was something like 200, 250. So basically, as they owned thousands, they, they had to form pub companies and they had to sell them to pub companies. Pubs became part of the property world and they were more useful for the value of their real estate than it was for how much beer they sold. So therefore, it meant that the rents all went up and it, anyway, it wasn't just the cricketers that closed. Over time, it didn't happen straight away. I think that September, which was Lady Day, I think something like six pubs changed hands and then within two or three years, I think it was more like 20. So. There are still pubs going now putting on live music, like the Half Moon of Putney, for example. But generally speaking, that was the beginning of the end for pub rock. So there you go. So thank you for watching this. And now this is why I can't see. Well, hello. Despite the attempt at continuity, the same shirt, but red braces now, it's actually four months after I shot the rest of the video. And a lot's happened since then. What happened was, I was in India with my son, this is in January, and we were on our third or fourth day, we were in Mumbai, and we went on a day trip to these caves where a temple, a Buddhist temple from thousands of years ago was situated. And I, and we're going at this, and it was absolutely packed because it was some sort of festival going on. And there were, thousands and thousands of people. We were coming down the mountain on this path. I realized that I had a detached retina. Now the next day we're due to fly to Trivandrum. Now Mumbai obviously is one of the centers of everything in India, one of the big cities. So my instinct was not to go, and it's a good job that we did actually. We got on the plane and went to a tiny place near Trivandrum called Kovalam. And to cut long story short, my son saw a sign that said opticians, and he said, that's a good place to ask if there's a, an eye hospital nearby. Not expecting an awful lot, we went in the opticians. And there's a guy in there that turned out to be an eye surgeon, what are the chances? He looked at my eyes and things and rang up his boss, who was the head surgeon at the local eye hospital. I mean, you could not make this up and book me in for an appointment for 10 o'clock the next morning. This is about five o'clock at Monday, was it? Yes, it was Monday. So on the Tuesday morning at 10, we got a taxi and went to this hospital, which was only sort of eight miles away. Again, cut long story short, they operated on my eye the same day, which was great. Put some oil in, basically, to hold, my, so the eye would heal and all the rest of it, right? My left eye was already messed up due to an earlier incident, which I won't go into now, so I can't really see out my left eye. And my right eye, which is my good eye, had the detached retina, so it meant I couldn't actually see a lot at, at all. No more reading, that's basically what happened. So anyway, again, to cut long story short, came back to England, went to Moorfields Eye Hospital, they got me in and they looked at it and unfortunately the retina had detached again, so they booked me in for another operation and the guy did a fantastic job. And um, here we are now, which is in May, and they did something with my left eye, which means I can see a lot better out of my left eye now, which is really good. I wasn't expecting that, not to the extent it is. I still can't read, I think I can now cross the road, which was a bit of a thing, because the, there were times of the day, you know, when the sun was shining or when the sun wasn't shining, oddly, where I couldn't really see, there was no, no contrast, if you know what I mean. So, so unless a car was bright red or bright yellow, it was like any other shade, I couldn't actually see it till it was there. So made crossing the road a little awkward. So anyway, that's where we are now. After they did my left eye, which was only, what, last Monday, only since then I've been able to, because I've been trying since January to complete this video. So anyway, thank you for watching. That's basically what happened. I'm going to see them again on June the 24th, I think it is, and they're going to see whether, whether everything's fine, which case they can take the oil out and I can be able to see again within four to six weeks, apparently after that, or not. So fingers crossed. And thank you for watching. See you next time. And don't forget to like, subscribe, all that sort of stuff. I'll try and do more videos now I'm back in the saddle, so to speak. Thank you.